Bitcoin then is incredibly novel in that sense because it's the only money commodity, anything that you can audit without any special privileges or permissions and know exactly how much exists for the smallest unit. I, I don't have words to overemphasize that, but at the micro level as well. So you can prove to me cryptographically without any third party in between that you are the owner of a certain amount of Bitcoin by virtue of both feats. So, you know, this proof of reserves model historically has been applied to exchanges, to custodians, to large entities, but you know, sort of as a mental model, I've been trying to adapt that same idea to individuals. You are your own bank, you are your own, your own custodian. At the level of the network, you're equivalent to any other entity holding any keys. And you also have a need to prove your reserves um, as well. So there's a bit of, you know, language and marketing that gets into that, whether it's proof of reserves for individuals or funds. Um, you know, I, I leave that to the marketing department. But yeah, that, that's our vision. Hi, everyone. Welcome to our show. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of talking to Sam Abbasi. So this is our first episode of Bitcoin Businesses. And so I was thinking Bitcoin is uh, going to be the foundation of global monetary system. And uh, it's going to be a protocol for value transfer over the globe. But, it, but, you know, as a foundational protocol, it also needs a vibrant ecosystem around it to reach its full potential. What makes that but what what makes that potential materialize is all the businesses that are around it and enabling users uh, to to get the full advantage of what Bitcoin offers, creating tools and solutions and simplifying things and reducing transaction costs. And I thought uh, we don't know enough about all the interesting things that are you know, that Bitcoin in businesses are doing and what are the uh, uh, you know, interesting ideas that are upcoming in the future. And we just don't hear enough from founders that are hard at work to develop useful services for us. So that's why we uh, embarked on this journey to uh, talk to Bitcoin founders. And this is our first episode. Uh, very, very excited to talk to Sam. I've been following his, his work and company, uh, for a long time. And, you know, every few months they're doing something, something that interests me more recently. I'm very excited about their partnership and collaboration with ETFs to prove their, they actually do have reserves, which is something very, very important, uh, for Bitcoiners to, to see, you know, all these Bitcoins that are, uh, supposed to be. Um, in, in reserves at those ETFs, are they actually there? So, uh, this is one of the things that Sam and his team are working on, but today we're going to hear all about our, their work, the problems they're solving, their ideas, their journey, and, uh, the good and the bad and the pain and the achievements, right? So welcome, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and this, your story, what got you into this whole space. Thank you, Sina. Thanks for having me. And it's uh, great to be here. And so, yeah, I guess starting with a bit of a background is probably best, right? Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I guess starting at the beginning, my, my degree is in economics. So that's where I come from. That's my happy place. That's sort of what interested me when I was younger. I did a bit of uh, journalism as well as my first job. Um, there's some skill sets that like carry over. Um, you'll see why, you know, research has been a critical component of my career and, and, and a lot of my interests. Um, just quickly, the cool thing with journalism is, uh, at least in like the entry level positions, you, you know, you have to come up with, um, you have to become an expert on any given topic within 48, 72 hours, be able to understand all the deep technical, um, details and nuances, and then be able to, you know, explain that in a simple way to other people, which is, you know, the only real way to prove that you understand a complex topic. Um, so I cut my teeth doing that at the beginning, but my degrees in economics. And uh, I got into a bit of neuroscience um, research after after college. I was basically looking at traumatic brain injury um, and pulmonary complications after after the brain injury. Um, I love doing that. That was you know basic science research is what it's called, but basic doesn't mean that it's simple necessarily. It just means that it's very low level. It's the basic building blocks. Um, so that was uh, that was you know like hardcore grungy lab work, um, looking at different samples from rats and rabbits and trying to you know basically match biomarkers together. Um, so, you know, I fell in love with doing research. Uh, the only thing is a lot of that research, the end result is typically drug development. And that takes, you know, 10 to 15 years to actually get into the hands of patients. And, you know, being someone who's not very patient, um, naturally, that was a little bit too long of a cycle. Um, around which, that same uh, time, which institutes, Which institutes were there, your degree and your research later? 
the econ degree is from Loyola University, Chicago. Um, I've been in Catholic school my whole life. And uh, the uh, neuroscience work was over at the University of Miami in the Miller School of Medicine. Oh, very cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was, uh, that was sort of the, you know, I, I think in terms of looking at the different jobs I've had in my career, um, or just the different jobs I've had generally, that was definitely one of, one of the most interesting because again, you have exposure to these complex, uh, you know, um, biomedical sort of techniques and in, in a, in a, in a very hands-on way that you probably wouldn't have been able to, to, to get exposure to otherwise. Um, so that was the neuroscience work that I did. Uh, a couple of papers were published, um, some around explaining why patients were dying from pulmonary complications within a 24 hour period. Um, and then that got spun out into some stroke research as well. But at that point I had left already. Um, and, uh, this was 2017. So this is when, you know, the crypto market was going crazy. Um, and I had already done some software development work in the past as well. Um, self-taught a bit. And, um, I had an opportunity to join a friend who just finished a boot camp. Um, doing basic, you know, full stack web development. And we set up a dev shop doing that part time in the beginning, uh, building, you know, what, what websites, web apps, uh, mobile apps, um, basic like inventory list apps, nothing, nothing too complex to be honest. Uh, but we were getting a lot of inbound from what were crypto clients at that time. Um, so, you know, you can kind of imagine the sort of profile. You know, this is Miami itself isn't exactly the most sophisticated place, uh, both financially or technically or sometimes culturally and sprinkling crypto in 2017 on top of that, you know, we'll, it, it resulted in a very interesting, like motley crew of characters and, and, uh, and, and learning about Bitcoin sort of in the midst of all that was, 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 you know, something I think I'm blessed with because I think people that come into Bitcoin or have come into Bitcoin in the last, let's say three or four years have been blessed because you know, you have a very large contingent, um, of people that are very adamant about educating you about Bitcoin and Bitcoin only, um, as well as just the you know ocean of content that's out there today, uh, there was a lot of content in 2017. You know, the Nakamoto Institute existed um, as an example, so there was definitely resources that I could look to. But sort of learning by virtue of working on these projects, different ETH wallets, um, ETH entities at that time, um, and learning about the value proposition or, or lack of that these projects have, um, and what Bitcoin offers, you know, in a, in a very sort of um, uh, firsthand sense, was 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 incredibly helpful, incredibly. Um, beneficial. Uh, we worked on some enterprise projects here, some more, um, there was Hyperledger at that time, some more like permission blockchains. Um, and I was slowly getting orange pilled throughout that process. Again, working on these different client projects, getting exposed to a world I hadn't been exposed to previously. Um, so like a lot of people, for example, is, uh, the first time I heard about Bitcoin was in 2014. Uh, I was in college and one of my close finance friends was very involved in, you know, um, just the world, the world of finance. Um, stumbled upon Bitcoin. He told me about it. I wasn't interested. Wasn't that wasn't where my head was at, especially back then. Um, and so I got exposed to working in this whole, or I got exposed to this whole space purely by virtue of contract work, um, and sort of, you know, uh, making mistakes and learning by working on these different projects. Um, and, um, and so, yeah, throughout that, I got orange pilled. Uh, we closed up shop in 2019 when the crypto winner was happening. Um, no more clients were coming through the door. So we closed up shop. Uh, but I wanted to stay in the space. I, I, I saw it clearly had legs. Um, you know, the, 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 the ability to just program money as, you know, in, as, as an economic student was, was something unbelievable, something I never even con had conceived of previously. Um, so having that opportunity and just knowing that that exists and that you can sort of work with these things, uh, in a, you know, like, like non-permission fashion just blew my mind. Um, so I knew there was legs here. I knew I wanted to stay and which, which is also interesting because for entrepreneurs, you have to continually sort of question yourself. You have to be very certain in what you're doing and very certain in yourself and your ability to execute. But you also have to constantly question your assumptions because, um, you know, you can't have your head in the sand at the same time. Uh, but this was something I knew with absolute certainty. I just, I just knew it in my bones. Um, but at that time there weren't too many Bitcoin companies and there weren't too many jobs that fit my skill sets. Um, and having a bit of let's say, you know, imposter syndrome, um, I thought maybe I might be missing something. So Bitcoin makes all the sense in the world to me on the economics, um, which is, you know, the, the part of the system that I probably understand the best. Um, on the technical side, uh, you know, I'm not a PhD in computer science. It still makes all the sense in the world, but I, I could very well be missing something. Uh, so there was an opportunity at a company called um, Algorand. Um, frankly, I knew I wanted to sort of be involved in the Boston space already. There's, you know, a lot of brilliant people in that space. Um, or just in that area. 
uh, I had met a lot of people, uh, a lot of brilliant people who worked at Fidelity um, the year prior. So this is now 2019. Um, at the MIT Bitcoin conference, I met um, like Amanda Fabiano, for example, Alex Thorne. Um, I was reading a lot of Nick Carter already, and he had worked at Fidelity. So I knew there was um, a good base of Bitcoiners there, people who were very serious about, 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 about the crypto space, but, but more specifically about Bitcoin itself. Um, so I knew I wanted to sort of break into that space in some capacity. So Al Grand uh, was, an Aust- was a Boston-based um, crypto company, and, and a lot of MIT folks work there as well. So you know, the, the founder has a bunch of computer science accolades. Um, a lot of the engineering team came from MIT. It effectively was kind of like an MIT project that got, um, uh, you know, like, like spun out of MIT. So I figured, let me work with these brilliant people. Um, and let's see if I am missing something. And, and, and if, you know, I work there and I still think that Bitcoin is the only thing worth spending my time on, um, then I'll make that assessment at that point. And that's basically what happened. I worked there for a bit. Um, again, a lot of really intelligent people, very, very smart. Uh, but it just strengthened my conviction of Bitcoin. Um, for a few different reasons. Uh, so after that, I went over to Fidelity. Um, I was a director in their, um, what's called their uh, Fidelity Center for Applied Technology. So like a lot of corporates, they have their own corporate incubator. Um, they do a lot of sort of internal movement. So, you know, that's a way to build loyalty at these large companies, these large family companies. Um, but, you know, because the space was so nascent, experts, so to speak, didn't really exist. And not a lot of people who had experience existed either. So I was one of the rarities who had a lot of infield experience um, and a few other skill sets that, that, that match what they were looking for. Um, so that was, you know, an incredible uh, experience. I was, uh, I, was, I was able to basically have full discretion to work on the projects that I thought were most relevant to company and to Wall Street just generally. Um, so that looked like open source custody solutions. And that uh, was still, more, in, still in Boston? What was the office? That was, that was in Boston, yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. And then, yeah. so what was the thinking when they hired you? Did they have like clear projects? Did they knew they were going this uh, ETF route or some other more serious Bitcoin activity? Or was it more like, you know, let's just research on this thing and see what comes out of it? Um, a mix of all that. Um, they, they had a few existing projects that they needed some support on, but my mandate was to work on things that I thought were relevant um, because I already had a lot of experience with different crypto projects. Um, I had a decent enough topology to make an assessment on, 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 on what was relevant. Um, so it was, it was a mix of that, but also educational as well. So there were a lot of, you know, internal educational events that I helped lead, um, bringing in speakers, um, external speakers, bringing them in. Um, Alex Glassian, for example, was one, uh, we brought Nick Batia in, uh, a few other folks. We had an internal sort of like, um, uh, I think it was a privacy conference that we ran internally as well. Um, so yeah, it was a bit, a bit of education, educating both sort of people at my level but also the higher ups uh, as well, sort of explaining complex technical Bitcoin um, principles to and, and, and translating that into like Wall Street speak. Um, and then it was the projects themselves. So that was open source self custody solutions, um, a little bit of lightning work. Um, I, I did some basic proof of concepts on tokens on lightning back then as well. Um, zero knowledge work towards the end of my tenure. And then at the very end, it was on proof of reserves. So then you, you switched, you know, full-time Bitcoin developer, which uh, you, you, you started from self-taught programming, then working on ideas yourself, contract work, and then, you know, full developer, right? That's uh yeah. So actually a good, um, a question I, I hear a lot is like for people who are interested in entering a development space, uh, what, what would you say was most helpful as you were, you know, teaching yourself? what to do. And especially when there wasn't, you know, a lot of great resources, uh, about it, uh, what helped you the most to kind of get up to speed and make sure, cause you know, when you're programming money, things are very serious. You don't, <laughs> the, the tolerance for bugs are very low. So, um, how do you, so you, so you have to be reaching a very, very high level of confidence in your abilities, right? I guess, uh, tell us a little bit, a little bit about that journey of, you know, increasing, improving your skills. Yeah, certainly. Um, I don't know if my experience translates too well today because again, my, my gateway drug was Ethereum. It was just the most, um, yeah, I I don't, I mean, it may still be the case. It was, it was one of the most developer friendly, uh, platforms to work on. There was just so much depth tooling, um, a lot of resources and a lot of people to reach out to too. There's a million discord servers, um, and forums online where I can answer my questions very easily. Um, it was, uh, so, I mean, that, that, that's, that's frankly how I sort of built my development skill set within the, the, what we, you know, probably would call the blockchain ecosystem or the crypto ecosystem. 
Um, when it came to Bitcoin, it was much more frustrating because the dev tools didn't exist. I know that's changed since, um, but I haven't been developing for a, few, a, 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 cu a couple of years now, so I don't have content to point to. Um, but the resources that I use at that time to get up to speed on Bitcoin specifically were programming Bitcoin. Um, so that's Jimmy songs. I always mix them up and then mastering Bitcoin, which that's is, um, song. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. So, um, uh, so what made you kind of make, make the switch from Ethereum to Bitcoin? Learning about Bitcoin. Um, wow. Ethereum was the thing I worked on because that's where the projects were coming from. Um, as well as the enterprise blockchain work as well. Um, but once I learned what Bitcoin was, then, you know, it, 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 it was, it was obvious to me. I think the cultural aspects helped a lot too. I mean, the sort of like the sort of, um, at least in memory, the, the pivot point for me was, um, I went to building on Bitcoin in Lisbon in 2018. Um, and I'd already gone to a few Ethereum conferences. So I'd seen what those look like, and those are literally more colorful. Um, they're like more silly, I'd say a little bit more whimsical and fun. Um, people are there to have fun dancing. Yeah. Um, uh, but on the Bitcoin side, when I, when I, when I went to building on Bitcoin, I mean, it was, it was cypherpunk. It was, it was what I would describe as cypherpunk. It was, it was serious. Um, and it was very sort of countercultural as well, which had a little bit more of like a sexy appeal too. Um, so yeah, I mean, the, the transition, frankly, was just learning about Bitcoin's value propositions and learning about sort of the differences between what I've been working on and this other thing that, you know, I've, I've heard about, I've heard it slow. I've heard it's, uh, the, what, like the, the, MySpace, the Facebook, whatever they were saying back then. Um, but when I learned about what the thing actually does, then, um, yeah, it was very, very obvious at that point. See, you know, a lot of us sometimes get, um, frustrated by how much resources, uh, non-Bitcoin crypto projects use, right? Altcoin systems and, uh, you know, all the shenanigans, what they promise and never do and things like that. But we sometimes also uh, miss uh, the positives, the silver lining where, you know, Ethereum uh, practically allowed you to, you know, enter the space, brought you projects, uh, gave, gave you space to experiment. And then you finally decided that all of this would be, you know, find much better use in Bitcoin ecosystem. So it's, there is also, there is this uh, a feedback, I guess, from these altcoin projects back to Bitcoin. So for some time, I guess, energy, uh, money might be attracted to them, but over time, a lot of good also comes from them back to Bitcoin. Yeah, I've, 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 uh, I've, I've, I've mentally sort of made that argument. Um, and it's, it's, it's tricky because it's sort of like saying, you know, there's some good that, that can come out of sin or bad behavior. Um, and that, that's, that's, it's true. It doesn't mean that you should seek the bad behavior, but it just means that there, you know, typically is light at the end of the tunnel, so to speak. Um, I, I, I did a talk. I don't remember what year it was, but the, the, the title of the talk was the point of working on shitcoins. And it was just a description of my journey. Um, so very anecdotal, but it was, it, I mean, the, the, the summary of the talk was, look, I've worked on these things. I've seen why they're inferior. And because of those things, I now spend my time on Bitcoin. Um, so that resonated with a few folks, um, but that's how I see it. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Uh, very detailed explanation of your story and uh, very intriguing. Uh, you've changed a little bit, right, from economics to neuroscience uh, and then from there to developing and then from there to uh, Bitcoin and uh, also building your own company. So you went to Fidelity. You had the freedom to work on a lot of things, which sounds a wonderful opportunity. Um, and... Then at some point you probably you observe some of the needs that a lot of other people can't can't see. Like I feel like a lot of startups have uh, successful ones see a problem that you know doesn't look like a problem from the outside, but you only see it when you're uh, in the field and dealing with the day-to-day -day activities of uh, other economic actors and see oh that's a big pain point which I had never thought about and that becomes a um, you know basis for a new idea. So how, how was this transition from Fidelity to Hoseki? You, you didn't take any intermediate steps, right? Directly came out, established your own company. How did that happen? Yeah. What, where did you read that point, reach that point where you think, you know, I, I have enough here to risk my more stable career and get out and do something on my own? Yeah, I, I, I think it's one of those things where it's, you know, there's never a right time. Um, that applies to a lot of different sort of events in people's lives. 
Um, I mean, so I, 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 I met a bunch of great people, basically, you know, a lot of like when you're raising money, for example, a lot of it really, I mean, you know, I'd say more than half of it is, 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 is luck to a certain extent is sort of, um, having the right network, um, having built the right relationships, um, because there are a million ideas and there are a million people that can execute. Um, but having the combination of all those different factors really, um, you know, it, it is probably the easiest path forward. Um, I was, so, so I, I remember telling myself at that time, uh, sort of ending my tenure at that fidelity saying, I have a great salary, great benefits. Um, this is very comfortable. Um, you know, I'm putting in a decent amount of time and, and at work, but you know, I'm, 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 you know, blowing through expectations, um, because, you know, I, I come from an entrepreneurial background, so you typically don't turn off. Um, and when you translate that to a corporate world, uh, where things are a bit more regimented, um, you know, people log off at five and they're off on the weekends, um, bringing that sort of work ethic in, you know, it, 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 it it's, it's very powerful and, and, and not, you know, uh, what people in this, in, in, in those environments typically see, um, but I had this, I had this anxiety because I knew I could stay there for the next 30 years. Uh, and that comfort no longer, uh, felt like comfort. It, it really felt like, a sort of, um, uh, like a, a lack of fulfilled potential, so to speak, or, or something along those lines. Um, I, I realized I had more anxiety with the comfort than I would if I went and, you know, actually engaged in some real existential risk. Uh, so I was chasing the risk and I, and I, I think entrepreneurs are people that do what we do. To a certain extent are you know uh ad ad adrenaline junkies and one of the best ways to you know sort of satiate that need is to risk yourself um in probably one of the most like, extreme ways which is starting a company in a in a space that isn't really mature yet or isn't really proven either um and risking it all in that sense um so that, that was my thinking at that time um you're reminding me you're reminding me of bungee jumping <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah, that, that, that times like a hundred is, is basically, I think what it feels like. Um, but it's incredibly fulfilling. I mean, you know, creativity and creating things is an act of love. That, that really is where it comes from. Um, and the fulfillment you get from doing things like this and really seeing something that existed in your brain spit out into, you know, like real tangible things. I mean, I know, I know we're building software, but it's tangible enough as software can be. Um, and also finding, you know, and meeting amazing people along the journey who want to join you and, and see the vision. Um, and believe in what you're, you know, describing as well is incredibly powerful. Um, so yeah, I mean, I love what I do and I sort of love this journey that I've been on. Um, I was, uh, maybe a, a sort of a, a describing what that bridge looked like, uh, at the end of my tenure at Fidelity, I co-authored a, 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 a proof of reserve sort of like practitioner's guide, um, it's published on the digital chamber of commerce's, um, website. And that's, that was designed to be an artifact for exchanges and custodians, um, or, or an artifact they can look to when they decide to get onboarded to type proof reserves, um, set up or a regime. So, you know, that, that has a history section about why proof reserve is relevant. Um, the history of proof reserves itself it has a bit on the taxonomy on, on, on what auditing terms are today matched up against crypto terms. And then my bit was the implementation. So sort of how an exchange or a custodian could technically comply both on the asset side and on, on the liability side as well. Um, we can get into this a bit more, but Hoseki focuses on the assets and there's a strong piece as to why that's so. Um, but we did some work on, on liabilities too, if an exchange wanted to implement some sort of like work retreat, um, on their, on their liabilities. Um, so I was doing that work, but at the same time, I was trying to leverage my Bitcoin. I was trying to get, uh, specifically a mortgage using my cold storage funds. And that was just impossible. Um, you know, I was hitting that. Tell, tell me about it. Cause that's my problem too. You know, uh, did you really try to kind of leverage your stack as, uh, you know, su supplementing some of your, uh, down payment or any, so what, how, how would, how did that conversation go with the financial institutions? It, it, it well, the, the, it's plural. I mean, the conversations went, you know, I'd walk in, uh, waving around my like cold card or my ledger or my treasure and trying to like explain to them there, there's valuable assets that are sitting inside of this. This is a bare instrument. And then just being asked to leave because you know, those, those devices look threatening in some capacity. Um, it was, it was, you know, I, I kept hitting a wall. I simply wanted to factor my Bitcoin into my financial profile. Um, simply, you know, pr present a form factor uh, the same way I can for my other traditional assets. I'm able to print out a statement for my, you know, stocks that are in my Fidelity brokerage as an example, uh, or the cash that's in my city bank account or my, ba or my ba Bank of America account. Um, I'm able to present simple form factors that they're used to seeing, but there wasn't an equivalent for my digital assets at all. Um, so, I mean, that, you know, it was clear at that point that there's a problem. And, you know, 
being able to do more than buy, sell, and hold uh, probably is valuable for people, you know, for not just me. So this is not borrowing against your Bitcoin necessarily, essentially just adding that to your profile to help with the risk models and uh, Im improve your chances, reduce your rates, things like that, right? It's not even as, as uh, aggressive as borrowing against a Bitcoin. No, I mean, that's the direction that, so when we talk to our banking partners, that's the direction we, we, we want them to go into. And that's the direction we push them to go into, but, um, they're simply not there from, you know, a, 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 a risk assessment perspective. Um, a lot of them simply want to understand more about their existing borrowers and also market that they're open to a growing demographic. One of the easy ways is just be, is basically have a consolidated portfolio of you, allow your borrowers to integrate their digital assets, and that'll inform your product development and your, what will be crypto strategy moving forward. Um, so yeah, like underwriting and lending is, 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 is sort of like the final, like the conclusion of what our product does, um, and what we hope it'll become in the future as well. But today the market simply wants to understand more about how people are using these assets in the first place. Makes sense. Makes sense. So if you, uh, I, I guess we'll talk about this, uh, later as well, but I'm just very excited to ask this, this proof of assets is a time dependent thing, right? Is it, does it need to be updated, you know, every day, every week, because people can move their money, right? So, so how, how's that work, uh, in practice? Yeah. So th that's, that's honestly where the, where the fun part comes in, um, because it's such an nascent space and because, you know, even understanding the nuances of custody, um, let alone what ownership means or defining ownership, like none of that's well defined. And so a lot of this is on us. You sort of effectively set the standard by virtue of the work and the integrations you do. Um, so, um, so it just depends on what the data is being used for. If they're simply using the data for a consolidated portfolio view and there's no financial action being taken on the data, then the integrator. So let's say the brokerage in this case, isn't so sensitive about defining what ownership actually means because there's no added benefit to adding accounts that aren't yours because there's no, you know, loan being taken place. Um, uh, there's also, you know, there, there's, there's different ways to hold Bitcoin. So, um, that was. That that's pure. That 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 is the reason why Obsecchi exists. Because you can hold Bitcoin on exchanges, on different cold storage devices, in different custody setups, on mobile wallets. But the framework to express ownership of those property rights is missing. Um, by the way, I mean this is a problem in the developing world as well. Uh, the, the the reason why a lot of this clicked was because I'd I'd read a book in college called The Mystery of Capital, and in that book the author describes um, his thesis as to why the developing world um, is in poverty. Now, let alone the geopolitical implications and you know. Uh, foreign policy of certain countries um, that sort of result in in in, in a lack of these frameworks. Um, people in these countries have assets. The problem is they're missing all the frameworks to express ownership of those assets, typically legal frameworks. Um, and so, you know, I read that. That made a lot of sense to me. And I, I applied the same model to Bitcoin. I, like, Proseki is basically uh, sort of a parallel world where you are able to build the infrastructure for people that have what is dead capital. Um, you know, when I, when I, when I was getting onboarded to Bitcoin and being just, you know, mentally and emotionally sold on it, um, I was promised or I was told that I would be my own bank. Um, however, I realized quickly, you know, as someone who holds their own assets or holds their own keys, I don't have a lot of banking services. All I can do is buy and sell, but I, I, I can't, I can't leverage. Um, uh, sorry, I think I wanted to rant and I forgot your initial question. No, actually, that's a great point. Cause I want to interject something. Uh, you know, what you're saying is very, very uh, foundational. Uh, you know, a strong economy relies on capital liquidity. And the whole reason capitalism works, uh, and for all intents and purposes, that's the best system, at least, that humanity has found, uh, is that people over time learn to produce more than they need. So they begin to accumulate capital. Once they do that, then uh, you have options. You, as you know, as an individual, as an observer, as an economic actor, now you have some capital that will allow you to just you know make decisions. Should I invest in you know a new uh, a new tool or device or machine that will even more you know supercharge my productivity later, or should I trade this trade this assets with other people? Uh, and that's how economic growth happens. You know, people accumulating, actually not spending, because a, a lot of people think capitalism is about spending. It's about building capital. And once you accumulate it, that capital, this enables you to do, uh, you know, more ambitious, more interesting, more flexible investments that will uh, supercharge your productivity. And, and that's how growth happens, really. 
So, but all of that depends on capital being liquid, right? Capital being being easy to move, easy to use. If if during the time that you're building that capital, uh, it's like you said, it's dead, it's dead, and there's no way you can use it. That's sort of a missed opportunity. And in a way, the you know what I see you guys doing is you're unlocking a lot of uh, value that's that's chained. You're unchaining the the value that's uh, that's uh, in people's stacks. And as Bitcoin grows, this problem just multiplies. You know, it's, it's much much more important, much more critical, and the value to society of having such a service uh, increases. Uh, you know, hopefully all of us are building our stacks and at various points, uh, we will feel the need to leverage that asset to do something, right? So this is, I think, an incredible, uh, and I probably might even say underappreciated, uh, you know, service that's, it takes, I guess, it takes some discussion like this for people to realize how critical uh, things like this are. Yeah, and you know maybe some of this is my fault, but it's it's really difficult to because um, on one side, especially on the investor side, you know you need to explain the near term. Like it's, we we have this grand vision of unlocking all this uh, Bitcoin value, just as you eloquently um, described. Um, and there are a lot of applications that we just haven't you know been able to really spend a lot of time on and and sort of like uh, really build a build a. I mean, just as like an ecosystem, build a vision of, of what this will look like at scale. Um, but you have to also be able to build products that are functional today that people need today uh, for use cases that might be or are or, or slightly different than what your ultimate vision is. And you have to have that flexibility. But you're right. I mean, to generate capital, you have to have the infrastructure um, and to have and one of the most basic part, one of the most basic parts of this infrastructure is simply saying, like, these are my funds and you can and you can know so with certainty. Um, and that's why I think Bitcoin and specifically just the ability to audit Bitcoin is such an undervalued part of the protocol. Um, you know, I've, I've read in forums in like 2011 and 2012, people were using uh, sign and verify message before they would send a shipment if someone bought something with Bitcoin to ensure, you know, they would, I think the message would be their address or something, their home address. And they would, they would have signed that proving it. Yeah. With some degree of certainty, you are the owner, I'll send the funds. But I still think it's an undervalued part of the protocol, both at the macro scale and at the micro. I mean, no one knows exactly how many US dollars ex exist in circulation. It's an estimate at best for a few different reasons. Um, and the same applies to above ground gold. Uh, the total amount of, of, of total amount of above ground gold is just an estimate. That is the biggest problem that the Federal Reserve has because they have no idea how much money exists, and they're just trying to fool around with interest rates up and down. But they don't really know what's going on to the to the amount of money. The whole reason we have monetary policy is to adjust mon money supply, right? Again. Or as Bitcoiners, we have different perspectives on it. But what they think is we built this system to adjust supply of money. But over time, it became became so complex, so so opaque that no one knows how much money exists. So now, instead, the policy has shifted towards psychology, and and you know, <laughs> you know, acting tough, acting easy, and and pretending that uh, we have a lot of tools. So just a tangent on that. Go ahead. And and so Bitcoin then is incredibly novel in that sense because it's the only money commodity, anything that you can audit without any special privileges or permissions and know exactly how much exists at the smallest unit. Um, I, 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 I don't have words to sort of overemphasize that. Um, but at the micro level as well. So you can prove to me cryptographically without any third party in between that you are the owner of a certain amount of Bitcoin by virtue of both teats. So... You know, this proof of reserves model historically has been applied to exchanges, to custodians, to large entities. But, you know, sort of the mental model, I've, I've, I've been trying to adapt that same idea to individuals. You are your own bank. You are your own, your own custodian. At the level of the network, you're equivalent to any other entity holding, holding any keys. Um, and, and you also have a need to prove your reserves um, as well. So there's a bit of, you know, language and marketing that gets into that, whether it's proof of reserves for individuals or proof of funds. Um, you know, I, I leave that in the marketing department. Um, uh, but, but yeah, that, that's our, that's our, that's our vision. But then how exactly are you solving it? So the problem we're solving, um, just looking at it purely as a software product is there are several different places where people hold Bitcoin and maintaining all the different integrations is just too much overhead. A lot of these exchanges, for example, change their API, you know, every quarter or, 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 you know, every, every six months or so. And 
you know, it, the, the changes also aren't as logical as you'd expect. Um, so maintaining that and um, running that overhead is sort of where our value is. That's on the exchange. And the one side. part of it is informational and reporting value, right? Reducing complexity of managing information about different holdings, centralizing all that information for, the, is that for the user or for a, a counterparty to that user? A counterparty to that user. So it's a B2B2C model. So our customers are the banks or the brokerages. Um, the lending institution themselves, the financial institution, uh, they're our customer, uh, but their, custo their, their customers are the ones who are importing all that data. So I sign up with you. I'm, I'm the customer. Let's say I, uh, my bank wants to know how much money I have, how much Bitcoin I have. Okay. And then I have ETFs. I have some money at Coinbase. I'm not smart. And then I have some, uh, <laughs> some in hardware wallet, right? So what happens? Like I, so the bank hires you, uh, you talk to me, uh, and then you get some, you know, my wallet addresses, how does that work? Yeah. So the form factor, um, you know, if you know Plaid, it's, it's a, it's a Plaid-like experience. So it's a white labeled solution powered by OSEC on the bottom, but the bank's logo or the integrated logo is on the top. Whenever they click either connect crypto or connect digital assets or connect Bitcoin, you know, whenever they call the, the CTA buttons up to them, um, then we pop up, we pop up in the white labeled widget and we have all the different, uh, places where you can hold Bitcoin listed. You can click on whichever the respective one is and then go through the verification process. Um, they differ depending on where the funds are. So if they're on Coinbase, for example, Coinbase user uses OAuth. That's a simple OAuth login. For most exchanges, they're, they're API key based. So we have instructions. We generate read-only API keys, give them over to us, uh, click continue, and then you're shot back in the beginning and you can keep adding accounts if you have multiple accounts or just finish the process. But essentially, you're relying on Coinbase to supply proper information. You're relying on different sources. And then if it's a hardware wallet, you probably get I don't know, XPOB or something that allows you to track uh, track, uh, new wallet generation and all of that in one place. Yep. So it depends on the, on the, uh, cold storage device. So for example, with, uh, Trezor, they have Trezor API, um, so that you get kicked off the Trezor's own sort of UI, their own experience, um, depending on what you're connecting. So you can connect the wallet in that case, we grab an XPUB and, you know, a certain stop gap of addresses, um, that we continually can keep looking up and keep adding, um, or you can sign for an individual address. Um, that's more of a privacy conscious way of, um, of adding your accounts. Um, or if you want to add support for a wallet, there's also a more manual way of doing so as well. If you don't want to go through the specific, uh, wallets flow, but for most users, they rather just go through, if they're a treasure ledger user, they rather go through the simple experience. Um, so if I have some money on, I don't know, like an app, a blue wallet, um, they, so then you, you'd need them to have an API. Depending. So blue wallet is different because blue wallet allows you to actually sign messages. So with blue wallet. Um, they would manually go in, grab the addresses that they want, paste them over um, with their corresponding signatures. So it's on a direct connection to Blue Wallet. It's simply leveraging a feature that Blue Wallet has live. Um, but for some of the other mobile wallets, yeah, they're 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 also API based. So okay. it depends on what the integrator. Um, well, it's it's the 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 the, the onus for the, for what this data means is on us. So obviously, the quality or I guess um, the risk profile um, of, a, of of Bitcoin that's on Coinbase is completely different than Bitcoin you're holding yourself. And so that's tagged accordingly and they're aware. Um, and it's up to them to make the assessment of what that means on their end. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. That makes sense. So now my bank knows I have a variety of uh, uh, holdings. Uh, what are the privacy challenges here? Because maybe I don't want my bank to know uh, too much, right? What are, the, what are the ways people can kind of have a medium ground there to, to not divulge every little thing they do, but also demonstrate that that's my total? Yeah, this has been the most challenging, uh, sort of the, the most, the most complicated and challenging part of what we've built because, you know, coming as, 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 as Bitcoiners and our exec team are all Bitcoiners too. That's, you know, the first thing we think of them. That's usually the first question as well. Um, so, uh, so first of all, you can add, uh, so if you don't want to add your entire wallet, for example, you just provide a signature for an individual address. Um, so from that perspective, that's more privacy protected because you can. Even if you want to be a little bit more manual, you can move funds to an address and use that for these purposes, provide a signature, and we, we wouldn't be able to sort of have any access to the wallets or have any uh, visibility on the wallets that those Bitcoins get sent to afterwards. Um, and then you can always request for your data to be deleted as well. Um, so from that perspective, you know, if you're a very, very privacy conscious Bitcoiner, you wouldn't just connect your cold storage. You would um, provide a signature and prove ownership of one address or a collection of addresses. That way we don't have access to your whole Xbox. Very interesting. Very so I can see, you know, this feature over time being added to, to some of these apps where 
uh, you can create an, a, a, just a new account, a new wallet, and then some of your money in there. And from that, there is an, a seamless integration to uh, whatever reporting tool you're using, uh, perhaps a whole key integration. And then, you know, like every money that's um, in this address uh, is kind of known to the counterparty. Anything else is, is managed. But we don't have at the moment any kind of wallet that makes that process easier, right? No, not that we've been able to find. No, no, no. Um, I just wanted to know the, the, the interesting thing with sort of, uh, all this data we're able to provide is, is really how rich it is. So for instance, if they are trying to underwrite your Bitcoin, um, having a Coinbase account with multiple transactions a day and your balance changing frequently says one, says something about sort of, sort of your investment profile in, in the digital asset space. If you're holding your funds in cold storage and they haven't moved for years, that's just entirely different. Um, so, you know, this, this really allows them to better, uh, assess sort of the investment behaviors of their borrowers as it relates to digital assets. And it's just data that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise. I wonder if there's somewhere, there's a machine learning algorithm that's kind of analyzing all these things and adding a flag. Okay. This guy is a degen by 99% <laughs> likelihood. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, a lot of the onus is on us with this too, because, you know, we're asked to provide some education here. You know, if someone is holding their funds in a multi-sig. Um, again, that, 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 that says they're more conscious and they're more sophisticated than someone, again, who holds funds on exchange alone. Um, so a lot of this is really advising our integrators and sort of, you know, educating them on, on, on what these different setups look like. And that frankly just takes a lot of time. Um, but yeah, there's, there's an endless ocean of, of, of what the state can mean and sort of how it can be applied as well. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. There's, uh, a wealth of data that, uh, over time, I guess like you, you can you can build additional services based on what you learn from, from this rich data. So very interesting because it also gives you a holistic view of, uh, of, of, of your customer. Yeah. So, uh, tell us more about the specific solutions. Like one, uh, we, we, yeah. I think, I think that one, uh, you explained it very well, a, a, a holistic per view of, uh, bank customers ownerships. Okay. What else? What else are you working on? So that's Hoseki Connect. So we have two products. Hoseki Connect is what, it, is what we've been describing. And then the other institutional product is Hoseki Verified. Um, so same underlying infrastructure, same principles with applied to a different demographic. In this case, it's um, solving what people traditionally think of when they think of proof of reserves. And, you know, this is one of these sort of, uh, you know, you feel like an old, like, uh, I don't know the name of the old man, the Simpsons, like me, but the guy who's like yelling at the clouds. Um, cause I've been doing it for so many years now. Um, and it's slowly gaining adoption at this point. And, and it did so in sort of, uh, in a way I didn't expect once the ETFs were announced, um, or once they were, you know, once we had suspicion they were going to be approved. So let's say sometime in November, um, it became apparent that, you know, these are traditional financial products that are touching traditional finance, touching, you know, actual normie retail or could be, and probably will be, um, there need to be more robust guarantees on the underlying because. Uh, you know, our space has been rife with exchange hacks and fraudulent activity. Um, and a lot of that could have been mitigated with having proof reserves regimes in place. So, you know, if, what is it? 90% of ETFs are held at one custodian, the existential, I mean, the systemic risk, uh, if something happens, but you know, I think they hold sort of about, different. they hold more than 1% of the supply at this point, uh, 17, That's what I've seen. $18 billion of inflow. So you can run the numbers and see what percent of supplies is. Uh, in, it's a huge, huge percentage. So it's, it's very important what happens to them. Yeah. And, and, you know, there's a lot of excitement, obviously it, it sort of felt like we had there, I mean, not, maybe not one outright, but it felt like we're winning, you know, we're, we're, we're now entrenched into traditional finance. And I know different Bitcoiners have different perspectives on what success for Bitcoin itself looks like, but from my perspective and the way I see Bitcoin moving in the future, this was a huge win. Um, but I just want to be careful and sort of, you know, maybe raise the alarms a little bit and see that we shouldn't be getting too drunk here because um, there is real systemic risk and, and it's, and it's not unfounded either. It's not like, you know, there's a, there's, this is a complete hypothetical that an exchange might get hacked. This has happened several times. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm putting together a blog post and why this is actually more important. This is helping me think through it, but Hoseki Verified is that product. Um, so we, we work with both ETF issuers as well as public companies who want to provide a level of transparency for their shareholders. This is important because, um, I think Andreas talks about this. There's a concept called infrastructure inversion, where um, 
there's a new technology. So let's say cars and cars were developed and that new technology has to ride on the rails of the old technology for some time. And then there's a flip and the old rides rides on the rails of the new. Um, so with the car example, when cars were developed, um, there was no infrastructure for cars. There were no gas stations, no uh, traffic lights, uh, no paved roads. Um, so it was a very hostile environment for cars. Uh, you know, you're sort of maybe able to go along the road, but it's definitely not built for you. Um, however, once cars became more mainstream, having the old tech, the horses ride on the rails of the new paved roads for cars is incredibly easy and trivial. Same applies to telecom and the internet. So, you know, uh, internet on telecommunication lines, incredibly uh, cumbersome, not efficient at all. Uh, voice over internet, easy. Um, so same applies to fiat and Bitcoin. Um, you could replicate sort of fiat inefficiencies, inefficiencies on Bitcoin. You could make a Bitcoin transaction take three to five days if you'd like, um, but it's a much more efficient system. And so when we look at traditional financial products and risk management, I think we need to reevaluate what the asset is and, and, and what the actual risks are. And again, it's not hard because we've already experienced this for the last 10 years. Um, you know, the traditional audit controls of annual or biannual or even quarterly audits, in our opinion, is insufficient. Uh, you have an asset that can be, you know, transferred instantly, um, billions of which can be transferred instantly, um, finally, with no recourse. And those implications are just simply different. So our argument is you have to have real-time verification, some sense of, uh, of, of uh, verifying that the underlying Bitcoin exists and display that in a very easy to consume way for not just your shareholders, but the market at large. Um, so that product is called Hoseki Verified. Okay. So um, first of all, paint for us the picture that we will see if we don't have a tool like this, what's the worst thing that can happen? Because, you know, ETFs also offer, I, I hope, I haven't looked at the legal documents, but I hope there is like a strong um, property protection uh, around it. Like if the ETF loses the money due, due to a hack or some screw up, uh, my guess would be that the customer will be made whole. If you know anything about us, let us know. But let's say they get hacked. Okay. If you don't have verification, what are the things that can go wrong? So tell us more about that. Um, yeah. So I think they do have some sort of insurance policies, but uh, I'm not entirely sure at the moment, so I can't speak to it too well. Um, it's... Uh, well, I mean, ultimately, the, the systemic shocks in the crypto world alone would be disastrous. But because it's a traditional financial product, it's also there's there's some like sort of uh, cross market risk because the more we get entrenched into TradFi, the more relevant um, you know the the shocks that we experience are in traditional finance and vice versa. Bitcoin's been pretty correlated up until this point, um, or still is rather correlated. Um, and you know, this building these types of products just make it just makes it more entrenched. Um, but ultimately, it's confidence. I mean. You know, it, it, whether, whether there might be some kind of inside job through the government or otherwise, um, it, would, it, it, would, it, would, it would set us back several years. Um, a lot of the FUD would simply come back. This is, this is a risky asset. It's inherently risky. It has no future. Um, and it's just not as, not as reliable as the fiat money we have today. Um, so I think it's more of a, I think it's more of a, almost like a branding and, 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 and reputational risk more, more than anything else. What it looks like is, Mt. Gox, for example. So Mt. Gox and FTX are both great examples. Um, you know, Mt. Gox was hacked over time and their customers had no visibility over the assets that they were claiming they held. And so if you could have seen these reserves being depleted in real time, then you could have mitigated the risk. And the same thing applies to FTX. In their case, they had zero Bitcoin. Um, so it's, from, my pers from our perspective, it's less about uh, sort of preventing the risk entirely, but more about risk mitigation. And these are simple tools that, you know, there, there isn't really an excuse to, 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 to not provide this level of transparency, given the nature of what the asset does and the risk profile it has. Yeah, I think, I think if, uh, I think if uh, one of the ETFs loses a substantial portion of their Bitcoin, uh, they'll, they'll probably initially just try to contain the news as much as possible, not, not let people know. Because then, you know, anything happening to, to holdings will lead to mass exodus. Um, uh, and then they'll try to socialize the cost maybe, or sweep it under the rug, you know, to the extent I'm sure there's like strong legal, uh, uh audits and everything around it. But like you said, these are periodic, probably slow, uh, but ultimately most users don't, don't even know what's happening until they want to withdraw. 
right. then uh, that's when you realize, hey, there's not, not enough Bitcoin in this fund. What I was seeing was just a number. And I guess that that's the, that's the challenge that we are facing when more and more financial products are being introduced. This is the real Bitcoin, but they, they just show you a screen with a number and just ensuring that that number actually matches the real Bitcoin. That's something that, you know, users have no visibility into. So uh, how do you guys solve this? So let's say I have Fidelity um, and then we probably, uh, uh, Fidelity not, I guess, but other ones working with Coinbase, right? So Coinbase is holding our, our, our Bitcoin and they know uh, they have a list of addresses, probably like not just one, perhaps a constellation of addresses. Um, and then how does that translate into uh, you producing the proof of reserve? So they put you, put you in touch with Coinbase and what happens after that? Yep. So it depends on the integrator. It depends on, um, it depends both on the issuer and the custodian they're using and their custody setup. Um, so um, the cleanest way to do this is the most true to form way, which is uh, they provide a signature for the respective addresses um, that they're holding on behalf of their ETF issuers. We verify those signatures and we monitor the addresses in perpetuity. So every time a new address is added, we take a signature and we put that into our list that we're monitoring. Um, that's, that's the cleanest and most true to form way. So we try to impose that model as much as we can. Again, we're limited depending on the custodian. Um, some so, because so they have come. Does that allow you to observe all of their uh, inflows and outflows? Every time they add uh, uh, Bitcoin to their custody setups with their custodian, we're able to see that. Um, if there's some like intraday trading that doesn't hit those addresses, then we don't pick those up. But the ones that are on chain uh, that are put into their custody setup for the issuer themselves, we're able to see all of that. And why wouldn't they uh, just publish the addresses online for, to create confidence? So most of them um, are wary about doing that for potential legal ramifications in the future. Um, I think there was, there was some article that mentioned OFAC sanctioned wallets and none of these Wall Street traditional you know, brand name institutions want to be mentioned in the same sentence as OFAC, as o OFAC sanctioned wallets. So I think that for speaking them a bit. Um, and I think, I, think, I think it's also a little bit too aggressive for a lot of the traditional issuers too. Um, the asset itself is so novel and so aggressive and um, so unique in a lot of ways that I think that level of, um, of just uh, maybe like sharing information that would normally be private in the traditional financial setting was a little bit too much. So a lot of them like to see us as this, this interested third party in between who holds that data um, but doesn't share it publicly because of potential legal ramifications that they want to avoid. Um, yeah, we represent the balances because we're simply that trusted third party. We don't do custody. We don't do buy or sell. Um, all we do is verification. So, you know, they've, the market quickly has sort of, you know, taken our stamp of approval and has given a real product market fit in that sense. Awesome. So, um, uh, what about exchanges? Cause there's also a lot of talk about exchanges and that's actually where most of the problem has happened in the past. Uh, it's right. very easy once the exchange realizes that users just like that number screen number on the screen where, and they have no, uh, they're comfortable with that and, uh, they could be fooled into thinking, you know, that's real Bitcoin. It's very easy for them to say, okay, let's just move some of these Bitcoin somewhere else and invest it in another risky thing, uh, a fractional reserve banking, uh, on, on steroids. Um, what are the, is there anything that's, that you're doing with exchanges providing proof of reserve for those purposes, or is there any traction there? Yeah. I mean, nothing I can say publicly, but, uh, to, uh, honestly, to my surprise, yes, there is. Um, again, it happened in a way I couldn't have predicted, uh, when I was working on the stuff back at Valley, um, the ETFs, you know, I mean, we've been talking about it, we've been talking about ETF products for years, but it wasn't as tangible as it is today. Um, I think a lot of them are taking inspiration from the level and also the marketing benefits of a lot of these, um, issuers and public companies are getting from doing for reserves. Um, so again, nothing I can talk about, but. Um, but I would definitely hold out hope because again, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of surprised, uh, given what I'm hearing from exchanges and larger custodians that are brand names. Uh, historically, the problem with exchange proof reserves has been twofold. One, um, their customers historically haven't demanded it. So they really had no business reason to be transparent in this way. Um, and two regulators never forced them to. So again, they, they had no, uh, they had no real business incentive to apply this level of, um, audit that simply wasn't required. That is more of a self-regulatory um, imposition than anything else. 
Uh, so nothing on exchanges to date, but, um, but yeah, hopefully there's going to be some good news. Um, you know, there is this big problem in, uh, some of the sanctioned country exchanges, uh, say Iran, I've heard of some of the CEOs of their exchanges. Uh, when people ask about proof of reserve or something like that, their standard argument is, Hey, we're sanctioned. We don't want to really provide any information about our you know, where, where our money is, things like that, because that might put us at higher risk for, uh, uh, enforcement. Uh, first of all, what do you think about that? Uh, and then, uh, the, the challenge there is when, when things like that happen, uh, these exchanges actually then are given a free pass because they say, you know, we are sanctioned. There's a lot of security practices that we can't do. So then they've given a free pass to kind of subject the user to uh, very, very risky uh, situations. And to avoid that, actually, I've heard some users use uh, foreign exchanges that when you actually look at them, uh, it's been established, say, in, uh, in Dubai, but only works with, with Iranian customers. And it, it uh, it really sounds like, a, you know, a scam under the surface, because if you're an international exchange, just serve just serving sanctioned country users, that sounds very problematic because you can just close up shop and take all the funds. And what are those users are going to be able to do that? They, they can't go to international courts or anything. Um, so, uh, any thoughts on the proof of reserve? demands of these users is that legitimate is there a way like to technically prove that these exchanges have the funds without uh making to, without kind of making their addresses available something like that or no i mean there 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 isn't really um there there's i've seen some type of zero knowledge applications but frankly nothing that's practical or nothing that i've seen functional in the wild so you know i I think their concern isn't really founded. I don't have experience with foreign exchanges, so I can't really speak too much to it. But um, it, it frankly just sounds like there's an opportunity there to be opaque um, and to get away with some things you wouldn't be able to get away with otherwise. And they're just sort of leveraging that. But no, I mean, um, you can probably run some blockchain analysis and, and sort of like with, with some degree of certainty make an assessment. Um, but no, they would have to, they themselves would have to sort of self-regulate and comply and, and give that data over in order to, you know, probably say that 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 uh that they've done some kind of verification. Perfect. And what are the things that can go wrong with these proofs of reserve? How can how, could it be cheated? And also, um, it doesn't also show the liability side, right? So I can right. have some assets here, but I could be like heavily indebted elsewhere, and somebody having having a claim on my assets. How do you deal with these? And we're really happy you asked. I, I I forgot to get into the proof of assets and liabilities. Uh, well, 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 first on the, on the integrity of, of, of what the verification means. Um, so again, like I sort of learned this by, by virtue of building this product. Um, it seems like when it comes to risk, it's all about risk mitigation, not about risk prevention. So, um, you mitigate sort of the risk that these funds are being fraudulent as much as possible. So we do that in a few ways. Um, but the easiest way, and I think you brought it up earlier in the, in the, the, the uh, chat is, um, this is multiple, uh, uh, multiple signatures and doing verification multiple times. So I'll give you a quick sort of um, hypothetical example. If, if, if someone is using Bitcoin for underwriting purposes, um, that, that counterparty can very easily ask them to provide a signature uh, once a quarter, once a month, whatever cadence you're comfortable with. And again, they take, they, they take direction from us on, on what we think is the most robust. Um, and not only can you do it in intervals, but you can also time it. So you can say, uh, just in the system itself, uh, you can say, you know, we need, need a signature within the next 10 minutes. Um, and you have to do this once a week, once a month for the, for the duration of the loan. Um, same can apply to the institutions for Hoseki Verified. Um, on the liability side, so this is my favorite part of this incredibly nerdy and niche concept of Bitcoin audit for reserves, um, is the liabilities. Because when the FTX collapsed, when the FTX um, like disaster fiasco happened, uh, I remember being, I think, in a clubhouse chat, or maybe it was Twitter at that time, um, with people who were arguing against using proof of reserves because it, provo it provides some, some sense of false liability. Um, and they were saying that it's not a complete picture and a lot of the liabilities could be cooked. 
And my answer was that, yeah, they, they absolutely can be, and we shouldn't focus on the liabilities whatsoever. Um, the liability side of the proof of reserves equation is still some company's internal books. Uh, Bitcoin is different and novel in that it is a global ledger and what's on Bitcoin is truth, but there is no global ledger of liabilities. So you're simply not going to be able to provide the same level of assurances on the liabilities as you can on the assets. And because of that, uh, what we emphasize is simply the assets. Asset only transparency until we make that more or less a standard, then we can move over to the, to the liability side. I don't see a way to solve uh, the liabilities side of the equation, frankly. Um, there's some work uh, that some folks did at MIT that I worked on Fidelity as well. Um, again, with zero knowledge proofs and uh, basically making like a permissioned uh, ledger for all these different organizations. But frankly, that's going to require a regulatory push. That's not something that I think will be organically adopted. So in lieu of that, then let's be honest with ourselves and focus on the one thing we can provide real certainty with, which is, which is the assets, which is Bitcoin. Yeah, especially liability happens in the social layer, I guess. So, you know, you still own it. It's your ownership. But, you know, who gets to claim it first, I guess, uh, that depends on other contracts you've entered with other people, other organizations. You know, one of the things that really excite me is the opportunity, the, like we discussed earlier, is the opportunity to use assets in borrowing. Uh, say, you know, you have, and, I've, and I'm, I've been following some of the news about uh, institutions that say, give you a mortgage and they factor in your Bitcoin holding. Say you put up your existing assets, maybe um, home equity, and then they also factor in your Bitcoin together, home equity is very stable, more or less, uh, at least in the traditional sense, your Bitcoin is kind of counted as more, more volatile, more risky asset, but together the financial institution is comfortable counting them together and uh, giving you a loan equivalent to a percentage of the total. So, uh, but I haven't seen much kind of traction there. More recently, we are hearing from Cantor Fitzgerald um, uh, doing some work there, but I think you'd be in a position to kind of observe these things a lot better. Uh, can you tell us anything about like how the ecosystem is moving? What are kind of the, what are some of the earliest, uh, services, services we might see and where we are going? Yeah, it's, it's a, it's a completely, na it's a very nascent space. So, um, a lot of these are sort of future concepts that are trying to gain traction. Um, we've had conversations with a few of them as well. I think it's interesting. I mean. There's a, there's, there's this growing trend of asset backed lending. I've seen, um, you know, HELOC credit card companies. I've seen, uh, vehicle backed credit card companies. Um, again, these are securitized lines of credit with, uh, at least on the, on the vehicle side, for example, and I'm sure there's other assets that people are able to collateralize. Um, uh, you know, these are, these are non-traditional assets or at least assets that aren't really used for retail loans. Um, so the idea of mixing these things together, I think is incredibly attractive. Um, again, it depends on the risk profile of the lending institution themselves. Um, there's a few, for example, that, you know, will allow your interest rate to be affected. Um, if you're able to prove, you know, whatever threshold of Bitcoin that they, uh, that they, that they deem worthy or necessary. Um, so there's some incremental movement here. Um, but again, for the most part, I think we're, I think we're a few years away from seeing, um, you know, real lending use cases come to life. I think a lot of them first have to get comfortable with, with just what the asset is and how people are exposed to it. Um. Because when we look at custody, you know, these people are, you know, uh, people in these spaces just don't have the same level of, uh, of knowledge as we do. So the fact that you can even hold your own keys is completely novel. So once they get up to speed with that, have a better idea of the asset, um, then I think turning lending on is, 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 is almost like an overnight thing. Okay. Very good. Very good. Um, uh, is there any new direction that your company is taking? Uh, something that you can say? Um, any new uh, features or it's more about maintenance and upgrade and fine tuning? Yeah, at this point, um, it's, yeah, we're, we're constantly adding different integrations. Um, we have a few partners, a few large partners that we're going live with now. So, um, you know, the engineering team is hard at work on making those go live as fast as possible. Um, the other, um, well, the main thing outside of Hoseki Connect then is, is Hoseki Verified. Um, so. Yeah, the two things we're working on are public um, and, you know, the call to action that I would have if I can't have one is, uh, you know, if you're a public company or an ex or, uh, or, or any other large entity or organization who wants to uh, be public about their Bitcoin holdings in a publicly verifiable way, then Hoseki Verified is, uh, is the, 
is the product. Awesome. Yeah, actually, that's a great segue. If you want to send a message to anyone who is watching this and how they can uh, reach out to you, to your company, uh, who, who's best positioned to benefit from your services, all of that. Yeah, great. Um, so on Twitter, I'm at Sam Abasi. That's two Bs and two Ss. Uh, my email is sam at, sam at hosefi.app. And for partnerships, it's partnerships at hosefi.app. Um, yeah, feel free to reach out if you have questions about Hoseki, about our products, about our journey. Um, and, you know, if you're someone who's trying to leverage your Bitcoin, I'd love to hear from you and love your experience or love to hear about your experience. And if you're a corporate who wants to, um, you know, market to a new growing demographic um, and get new customers and better assess your own customers, um, then also please feel free to reach out. Awesome. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Sam. I, we really appreciate all the work that entrepreneurs like you are doing in this space. We root for you and we look forward to hearing more from your achievements and success. Thank you, Sina.